and then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does these things and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So let's begin with prayer as we go into this uh, very important section of this sermon. Father God, we come before you this morning uh, eager to study your word. And see from your own lips, Lord, your, your sermon, Lord, how it is we ought to view Scripture, how it is we ought to respond in certain situations, Lord. Uh, you have called your people to be holy, separate, uh, different from the world, Lord. Uh, a light and, and salt in the world, Lord, that is proclaiming your gospel and your truth so that you may be glorified and known on this earth through our lives, God. May we become imitators of you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. So then this portion, we're, we're switching a little bit from uh, teaching from being strictly, uh, well, not strictly, but from, from being this uh, instructional. This is what a believer looks like in the world. This is, this is their character. Uh, and really spelling it out for us to now a little bit more of a uh, corrective portion of the teaching. In fact, in the next, in the remainder of this chapter, <clears throat> and throughout the first uh, half of chapter 6, we see all sorts of corrections uh, through that, that Christ is making. Not that he is correcting the law itself. We, we just saw here, and, and we'll read it again, do not think that I've come to abolish the law. But I have come to fulfill the law. Uh, not to abolish, but to fulfill. So he's not correcting the law. He's correcting the, the, the people's uh, view of it, how they have skewed it, how they have added to it. Uh, and technical difficulties? Okay. <laughs> um, how they've added to it and, and how they have taken the law to mean one thing uh, when it has originally meant uh, another, and, and this is a common theme through, throughout the Bible. Uh, Do you have a question, brother? Yeah. What's up? Um, just going back to what you said, the weeds have fulfilled the law. <clears throat> that was back, you know, even in uh, yeah. I've never that book properly. Uh, Levit Leviticus. Leviticus. Yep. Yes. That was part of the law, law that he was saying is going to put there, where we no longer, you know, sacrifice and so forth. Yes, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. That's some of what, what I'll discuss in terms of the fulfillment. Um, but yeah, there, there are uh, legal implications in, in terms of the law. So yeah, Exodus, Leviticus, even Numbers, where, where, and Deuteronomy, where we see these laws in action. And that's what the rest of chapter 5 is about. This fulfillment has legal implications, spiritual implications, prophetic implications. Um, and, and I'll kind of touch on those uh, as we're going. Um, yeah, there's, there's an aspect of, of some of the traditional laws, right, um, the ceremonial laws, the sacrificial laws, those type of things that, you know, that none of us in this room, I believe, are, are Jewish, right, and so we're, we're Gentile, we're, we're coming, we're grafted into uh, the, the branch, right, uh, we're, we're not of the Jewish people, there are some of those things that, that don't pertain to us, but Christ does spell out, especially in this sermon, uh, the things that ought to look at carefully. Uh, we're not doing away with the law um, because Christ himself is saying right here at, at the beginning of this portion that uh, the law should be ignored and, and there's much to learn from the sacrificial laws, even from those uh, because all, all those things do is, is they point to Christ. All those sacrifices that are not enough, they continue to point to Christ who is sufficient, right? And so even those laws, it's, it's good for us to see uh, and understand and know. Uh, so in this portion, um, the, this, this very beginning of this portion, 17 through 20, uh, I want to draw attention to, to four, uh, four aspects of how Jesus moves into this next section. Uh, the, the first aspect being the clarity of the purpose, and, and I've touched on it already. He says, do not 
think that I have come to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill it. So we, we see this correction, and even though Jesus is about to challenge man's interpretation of the law and, and how they're living it out, you know, the Pharisees and the scribes who are supposed to be experts on these things, they're, they're doing it in a superficial way, um, and, and that's what Jesus is addressing here in this portion. Um, Jesus not only held the law with reverence, but he also fulfilled it in a number of important ways. So like we were just discussing, he fulfilled legal demands of the law and the prophets by perfect, perfectly obeying the law. Um, there was no, uh, there's no spot or blemish in Christ, right? He never once sinned. He never came against the law. Um, he fulfilled the prophetic aspect of the law and the prophets by being the Messiah, right? He is the one that the prophecies are pointing to. They're uh, all leading us to Christ, the Messiah. Um, and he fulfills the penalty of the law with his death uh, by, by dying for us on the cross. He takes that penalty, that, that blood that is required for sin. Uh, Jesus himself takes it. So in that way, he fulfills that law as well. And, and Jesus even continues now to fulfill scripture as, as he sits at the right hand of the Father. He prays for his, his people. He intercedes for us. We see that in Romans 8. Um, he intercedes for his people. But at the very end, when he returns, that's when the fulfillment of all these things we're, we're looking at in, in Zechariah, where we've seen these prophecies uh, and, and these uh, eschatological ideas that, that the law and the prophets all point to. Christ is going to come and, and fulfill all those things as well. Right? He, he is going to be the total fulfillment of every word and, and, and that's what he says in, in verse 18 this is the purity of the law the second aspect I'm going to draw attention to the purity of the law in verse 18 he says until uh, I, I will for truly I say to you until heaven and earth pass away not the smallest stroke or letter shall pass from the law until it is accomplished so, so Jesus declares that the law of God is persistent, uh, it's eternal, it's always true, um, it's never going to be contextually, uh, you know, only parts of it, this, this portion of scripture, and we like to do that, right? We like to take a portion of scripture we don't agree with, and we say, well, that's, that's what Paul meant in, in this day, and we can think of some examples there. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, you know, with, with uh, women in church or uh, many things. That, that's, that tends to be one of the most contentious uh, areas where people will say, well, that's, that's contextual. Paul is dealing with a specific problem, yet he goes to creation, right? And, and he goes beyond where, where he is in his context. He goes beyond that. He goes to creation and how things were perfectly ordered. Um, and so th those are the things, the, the purity of the law. In, until Christ returns, every word in Scripture will remain true and useful for the building of his people. Uh, every word of it. Uh, there's not going to be one part of it that is not useful to us, even as Gentile believers uh, who have been saved and grafted in to the salvation. Uh, e even we need to know the law and we need to know the prophets, and we need to know uh, the Old Testament as much as we know the New, uh, because not the smallest letter or pen stroke. Uh, the implication that every single portion is important, uh, we, we see that in 2 Timothy 3, 3 16, right? Uh, and, and we can go there very quickly. Uh, we're, we're all very familiar with, with this portion. It, it rings so true. It, it needs to be something that we know in our hearts about scripture so that as we look at scripture we're not just brushing anything off because it's too difficult to understand or it doesn't agree with our sensibilities but uh, 2 Timothy 3 16 all scripture is God breathed and profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be equipped, having been thoroughly equipped for every good work. And, and why is this important? All scripture acts to make the believer strong in the Lord. We're to be ready to preach the, the, the word, the whole counsel of the word, not just God is love, but also God is wrath and he is justice. And, and then there is not just salvation, but there is also judgment. What are we saved from? We're saved from a judgment. We're saved from a wrath of God. It's, if we leave one part out, we're, we're, we're in danger of, of annulling aspects of Scripture. And so 
So why, why do we need to be careful with this? Well, Paul continues in, in his letter in, in chapter 4. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with great patience and teaching. That's the part that many people struggle with. Uh, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desire, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. And so we see that there's a great need because there are going to be uh, great fallacies that are being preached, and, and there are. There are today. There's so many so many, uh, let's say, communities, congregations, whatever, collections of uh, so-called believers, all under the, the umbrella of, of Christianity, and yet Christ warns us here, whoever annuls, this is verse 19, this is the gravity of this command here back in, in, in Matthew 5, in verse 19, whoever annuls one of the least of these commandments, and teaches others to do the same shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. So when, when we trivialize the word of God, when we uh, deny the authority of scripture, or we decide which bits and pieces of scripture are relevant, uh, we ultimately make ourselves out to be, uh, we ultimately make ourselves to be God, right? Because we're deciding what part of scripture is, is applicable, is important. When we're told by scripture that all scripture is applicable. All scripture is important. So there's a gravity to it. Uh, we must approach the gospel of Christ on God's terms, uh, taking him at his word, being obedient to all his commandments, uh, to the best of our abilities. We're, we're going to come up short. There's going to be things that we're learning. There's going to be things that we're going to be tested on uh, and, and may struggle with, but the, the believer is always hungering and thirsting for righteousness. They, they with, a, with a pure heart, uh, right, with our Beatitudes, we, we see that, we see this blueprint of the believer hungry and thirsting with a pure heart for righteousness and truth. And we must teach others to do the same. Uh, continuing in that verse, uh, but whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, so not only are we learning scripture for our own benefit, and, and we see that with, with Paul's words to Timothy in 1 Timothy, in, in chapter uh, 4, First Timothy chapter 4, when, when he tells them, uh, pay attention to your life and your doctrine. You know, pay close attention to how you live. For if you persevere in these things, you will not only save yourself, but, but others. And that's not Timothy uh, giving salvation to others, but it's by his uh, example that, and by his faithfulness to the word, by his faithful teaching of the word, that people come to hear the true gospel and are changed, convicted, uh, built up again in the truth and not just in, in man's uh, idea of what scripture says. And so we come to this last verse in verse 20. The, the severity of being hip, hypocritical in this area. Uh, for I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is not referring to a competition of, of who's holier than who. Um, it's not, well, I, I follow the word better than, than this person follows the word. It, it's not about that at all. The, the Pharisees were, were not holy. They were hypocrites. Um, they used the word to gain power, to, to retain power, to press upon people. Um, a majority of them. Uh, obviously, there, there can be uh, true believers in, in, a, in a messed up situation, right? We, we understand that. We, I think many of us have come from those situations, right? And so we, we ought not to deal too harshly with the Pharisees because we're very, very likely to have been just like them uh, until Christ saved us and called us uh, to understand his truth. But the Pharisees, as a whole, were not holy. They were, they were hypocrites. Uh, these people wore sheep's clothing, but were inwardly ravenous wolves, like Jesus will say later in this sermon in Matthew 7. 
uh, in Matthew 23, he, he calls these people whitewashed tombs. On the outside, they were, they were beautiful, pristine. They, they, they were clean and, and, and uh, immaculate, right? These, these tombs that were uh, opulent and, and just very uh, decorated, yet they were filled with the bones of dead men and all uncleanliness. Uh, I mean, what a, what a statement that Christ makes to the Pharisees, but that's exactly what we're given here as, as a warning. The, the righteousness surpassing the, the Pharisees is, is a warning of hypocrisy. It's a warning of uh, being good on the outside. Look at me. I'm a Christian. I'm doing everything right. But on the inside, doing, doing things to be seen, to be noticed for our own pride, for our own self-righteousness. Uh, I believe that that's truly the, the difference between... Uh, in, in, in my own salvation, uh, growing up Christian, growing up in the way that I ought to go, and doing all these things, and I am grateful for it. I'm thankful to the Lord that my parents raised me in such a way. But I was doing it out of my own strength and in my own understanding of what the right answer was. I wanted to be on the right side of the issue. If there is heaven and hell, I want to be in heaven, right? Um, and, and so, so much of it was, uh, in fact, Brother Danny and I were, were talking about this yesterday, uh, standing out there in the hot sun, uh, just discussing that, I mean, there's a great difference between, you know, you, you, you're, you're growing up and, and you're raised and you're told that, well, God has great plans for you and, and, and you're, he's given you such a gift. And, and in my case, it's been music. Uh, he's, he's given you such a great gift in music. Uh, he's going to use you. You're going to do great things. And so I pursued those things. I said, well, God's called me to be a, a worship leader. God's called me to do this. God's called me to do this. When when that was really man putting that in my heart. Now, some of it can remain true. The Lord may still use me in those areas. And, and all of that can still ring true. But it was never about, at least for me, this may not have been the intention. In fact, I'm, I'm sure it wasn't the intention of many of these uh, Leaders that I had it was not the intention to 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 uh, cloud my idea of, of my calling or anything like that, but I was trying to accomplish these things in my own strength, in my own understanding. Um, I went through a severe personal uh, identity crisis because these things were not happening, and yet, but God, you, I, I've always been told this was this was your call for me. Uh, that that this is what I was gifted for. This is what I was called for. This is what you. You want me to do yet all of my life is, is failing at this point I, I don't understand and that that was really the difference in, in February when when the when the word became alive and the truth became evident um, and, and convicting and <clears throat> the Lord just completely uh, reshaped uh, my entire heart towards towards him and, and towards this life uh, it was no longer about living in the way that was going to get me to heaven. It was just being thankful that God mm -hmm. never even chose me, uh, even changed me. Uh, and, and desperately desiring for others to understand the same. And, and out of that, uh, there's a zeal that, that ends up stepping on toes. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot of learning still that is going on as the Lord continues to teach all of us. Right. This book. Um. So if we go to uh, Luke 18, 11, uh, that's somewhat describing the same of what we're talking about. Do you want to read it for us, brother? It says, the Pharisees stood and was praying this to him, God, I thank you that I am not like the other, the other people. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, <clears throat> and even like the tax collector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's this. I mean, what what a great test that we that we truly know that we 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 know the Lord and that the Lord knows us. That He would change our hearts to to go away from that stuff. To, to like like we see with the Beatitudes, that, that foreign spirit, that mourning for sin, that that desperation, that I only need God. There's 
it's nothing about me. I, I, I'm not grateful that I'm not like so and so. I'm grateful that He saved me, but I'm desperate that they know it too, that they know the same salvation. So but those, the, the Pharisees, they, that, that that was their heart. Well, so it's truly to say not to be like Pharisees is like we all come from that, and we have. If you open your eyes and say, "This is who I am, who I was," and Lord, thank you for delivering me to. to, to is that more of an understanding of how we should be looking at it? Not saying I don't want to be I'm better than them. It's like no, it's it's, it's not a better, uh, but it is safe from that judgment. I mean, there there is uh, there is a gratefulness, right? That's where our gratefulness, our thankfulness, our, our praise to the Lord comes from. That place of, of being overwhelmed that that God would care enough about this sinner or, or, or any of us uh, that he would save us uh, that that's that there is a desperate thankfulness that there that, that should exist uh, and, and when it becomes or if we let it become or, or you know uh, about this well we'll look how far God has, God has brought me you know he, he's he's elevated me above then, then we get into the situation that the Corinthians were in Elevating gifts, they were elevating certain abilities, and they were elevating certain people, and, and, and we see they lost that first love, right? Uh, which is not the same church, but uh, it still rings true, right? When when we let those things come in, and, and that's what Christ is addressing in this in this portion, and He addresses throughout all of these examples of the law and how it's being misused. Is uh, we go straight from. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes uh, and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. We go straight from that into examples of how that law was misused and misinterpreted. Uh, so, so that's a great segue. Thank you, brother, for, for getting us into this next portion. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, 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 that's, that's great. Um, and I don't, we, we talk, did we talk about it sufficiently? Yes. I don't want to move on from anything I'd rather... Uh, Continue in any questions. Uh, but here we see our first example, and there's really six. There's six of these instances where Christ is saying, You have heard it said, or, or you have seen it written, uh, it be this way, but I'm telling you, this is, this is what that means, and this is how it's seen. And so we'll take it one, one section at a time, just so I'm not trying to rush through any one thing. But verses 21 through 26 is our first example we, 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 of, of our uh, dealings with the law. You have heard it said that the ancients were told, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be guilty before the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with the brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever says to his brother, Raka, which means fool, shall be guilty before the Sanhedrin. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, you, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering. Leave it there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law, while you are away with him, uh, while you are on the way with him, so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. May I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last quadrant, the, the last uh, of the dead. And so, here we see this first example, right? You shall not murder. Clear as day. Don't, uh, don't murder. But then we see the Pharisees, we, we see in addition to it, whoever murders shall be guilty before the court. Okay? But Christ says it goes deeper than that. It's not just about not murder. Whoever is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And so it's not enough <clears throat> that we just not kill people. That That's, I, I would venture to say that that's pretty easy for all of us to not want to murder people uh, in actuality. Uh, whether we've had those thoughts before, which which shame on me if, if I've ever had that thought. 
But even the anger, even what's in the heart, is enough to be sent, to, to fall short of this believer that Christ has established in the Beatitudes. Merciful peacemakers. Humble, merciful peacemakers who are pure in heart cannot allow anger to, to continue to, to, to exist in, in his heart. It's not enough that we don't kill people. Uh, Jesus tells us an angry person will be judged and, and not by man. Man can only judge on the outside, right? He, and, and we can hide these things. I can hide my anger from my boss or from a coworker or from anyone. I, I, can, I can hold my tongue and I can hide that anger, but that's still in my heart. That, that still is, is being held on others. Um, if you're anything like me, you've been in a position where you've had to go to someone and say, hey, you, you don't even realize that I've, I've had this thing against you. Uh, that, that really messed me up. Uh, I had to deal with that with, with two of my pastors from, from Tulsa. They didn't even realize how much they hurt. And yet that festered. That, that, and that really damaged our relationship. And they, they didn't understand why. They didn't understand why that was happening that way. Uh, and, and this verse 24 is really what jumps out to me uh, on this whole thing. Because I believe that it's, it's simple enough to, to see this concept uh, of anger, although we, we need to deal with it, we need to ask the Lord for help. But verse 24 is really what, what, what convicts me. If you are, or I'll start with verse 23, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering at the altar and first be reconciled with your brother, and then come present your offering. I mean, what a heavy instruction it is uh, that we ought to be careful. We, and we talk about this often, right, especially in the context of, of communion. We need to constantly be examining our hearts and how we – and what's in our hearts as we come to a, a Sunday service, as we come to a worship uh, time. As we come into our prayer, as we come into our reading of the word, our study of the word, as we come to Bible study, we ought to examine our hearts. Because if we have something against one another, or, or someone has something against us, and we know it, we know that we've, we've wronged them. That needs to be dealt with. It needs to be dealt with immediately. It, it, you know, Scripture reminds us over and over again, we see in Matthew 18, that we ought to go to one another. And, and, and seek that reconciliation. Peacemakers. Peacemakers. And showing mercy. But this, this severity that, that comes from dealing with this uh, anger in us, we ought to be very, very careful with that anger inside of us. Now, now there's, of course, we, we see anger uh, in terms of, of God's anger. And, and so, how do we reconcile that? And that, that's actually what Pastor challenged me originally when I sent him notes months, months ago about this was that, that's, that's often what we get confused with, but we need to remember, brothers and sisters, that God is perfect. He's righteous. He is holy. He, he, is, he is all uh, light. He is all life. Uh, he is all truth. He is all righteousness. Sin is darkness. Sin is death. Sin is all unrighteousness, all wickedness, all injustice. And those two things cannot mix. Uh, for us, when, when we're angry, it, it usually boils down to pride. Right? It, it almost, no matter what it is, no matter what the circumstance is, when we hold on to that anger, it's almost always because of some form of pride. We're jealous, we're frustrated, we want to get even from our business. Uh, we, we, we see the, how it's unfair. And all these things we, we hold on to and we say, well, I'm justified in my anger. And in our understanding, in our humanness, that, that's, that may be true. You can go to court and, and they might side with you. But that anger does not emulate Christ's forgiveness. It does not emulate the mercy and the peacemaking that we ought to have. Because it's ultimately pride. It's ultimately our own image, our own self. Yes, ma'am. 
<clears throat> I hear this a lot. Um, where I forgot what passed today is where it says turn the other cheek, you know, let uh, up there, forgive and up there. But yet, if you don't go and as they say right here, if you don't, if you're thinking that okay, I'm gonna let it go up there, you you feel that you forgive and walk away from it, but yet you really haven't because it always festers, like you said, it festers and it comes around and it holds you back from really being being hundred percent into it. So if that's the case, do is that considered as a sin of not fulfilling? Of going to your brother and asking for forgiveness, or consulting with that with that brother of what your concern is or your issue. So you're talking about re re repeat. Okay. A condensed question, right. <laughs> if, if you can, because I'm I'm trying to just make first make sure I'm clear on, on what you're first, asking. First, first the verse that says, you know, turn the other cheek, you know, don't let it get to you. And you, some people will turn around and say, oh, forget it, I'm not going to worry about it no more anymore. But yet when certain issues or some come cool past that goes across that same the open nerve, you know, they all, I'm not going to yeah. worry about it, it festered and it, it prevents them to going forward. But yet they're in their mind saying, I'm done, I'm uh, forgiven. I'm done with you, but yet you won't go full. Spiritually, you're not really going forward. Because you still haven't addressed that open nerve or that issue with your brother. Yeah, if, if you're holding on to it, and I think it ring, rings true even for our personal sin. If we don't address our personal sin, and we just, okay, I'll, I'll try my best not to deal with it. But there's no confession, and there's no, there's no repentance there. There's no reconciliation. Right, and, and we see that um, even here in, birth, in in chapter six, with with, with the with the prayer at the very end of it, you know, uh, forgive. Uh, I'll just read it for you. If you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. There it is, uh, an an effectual. Uh, there is a process of reconciliation in our confession. Uh, in, in our <clears throat> pursuit of righteousness, we're never going to be there, but, the, but there needs to be that, that pursuit, that acknowledgement, and, and that's what we mourn for, over that sin, right? If there's no acknowledgement and we just move on, there's not really any reconciliation, especially with one another. If I put off my relationship with, with a family member who, who uh, you know, there's, there's tension there, and there's disdain, then it just, like you said, it, it festers. And, and every time they come back, maybe they come into town or, or I go see them, it's a struggle. It's a struggle because it all comes rushing back because it's never been addressed. It's never been talked about. Uh, and I think those are the moments that, that reveal that, that we haven't forgiven that person, right? We haven't, or sought forgiveness if, if we know that they have an issue with us, but they haven't addressed it. We, we, there's a lot of people who are non-confrontational, right? I, I tend to be non-confrontational uh, for the most part. I, I've been a little bit more confrontational uh, in the last year uh, in the efforts to stand for truth, but with patience and understanding, we, we have to remember that aspect too, right? Uh, and, and in those moments, I've realized that I've had to go and ask for, for forgiveness from, from certain people, even though they weren't wrong, I wasn't wrong, but there is a tension, there is a, there is a disdain there, uh, a frustration. And we just ignore it because, well, we'll all get along, you know, we'll, 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 we'll get past it. Time heals all wounds. Confession heals those wounds. Uh, truth and, and seeking that, that reconciliation uh, heals those wounds. Uh, sometimes it, it causes a, a little bit of a, of a you know, pang of, of pain, right? When when you open up the wound in, in order to clean it and then stitch it back up together, right? And it, it can be painful uh, when, when you have to deal with it because you've tried to let it heal on its own, but now it's scarred and it might be infected, and, that, and that's what we're, we're talking about. That's the sickness. 
And so we need to go in and we need to, we need to clean it out so that the true healing can happen. Uh, it is missing the mark, brother, to know when we see Matthew 18, we see here, if you remember that a brother has something against you, if you if, if one another sin against one another, you must go to each other. You must go to each other. That there, that is the aspect of, of peacemaking that, that we're called to be reconciliation with one another and, and with Christ. Because, like, like you said, the, the other person may not even know that they did something wrong. They, they may not even understand that what they did was was hurtful. Yet you've you've put them to death already. Well, they, they did this, and so I'm no longer going to associate with them, and, and I'm going to leave this church, or I'm going to leave this situation. And people do that all the time because of hurt feelings and, and all these things when God's Word tells us to bear with one another with, with peace and, and patience and uh, with long-suffering, love, joy, peace, patience, all those things are, are pertaining to our relationship with one another. And so we, we, when we know that there's an issue, we must go through it. I've got well, several things. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll let Suki talk, and then I'll, I'll let you check. Well, I'll just say that um, you've asked that person, you know, for forgiveness, and they don't know that they did something wrong. Yeah. So they don't know that they did something wrong. You've done your part, right? As far as it is up to you, live at peace with all men. As far as it is up to you and your righteousness and your holiness, in, in view of God, not, not for others' sake, but but because God has called us to be that way. Be at peace with all men. So we do our we're best. We're not trying to force, you know, uh, oh, we, the we, forgiveness we on couldn't that. If we tried. We couldn't even, if, if we tried, because I can't affect that other person's heart and their response to whatever the situation is. Only, only the Lord can change that. Brother Jack, you wanted to come? Yeah, I mean, I, you, you did touch on this, but it, Go, the first thing we have to remember is every situation, like when it talks about um, Matthew 5, 13, you know, to, to turn the other cheek, everything is taken in context with one another. So yes, in Matthew 18, it says, 18, 15, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go tell him your fault between you and him. If he hears you, you will gain your brother. Now, this not only goes, this goes a couple ways. I've had people come up to me after, for years, and they said that they, they were upset about something. Why didn't you come and tell me? If somebody has something against me, I want them to come and tell me, not because I like to hear it so much, but I don't want them sitting there, because sometimes I would feel so bad. I mean, this person sat here with this anger, and they, they, they said, they, and all they had to do was come to me and talk, and, and I know personally I've been upset at people, I go and talk to them, and it all goes away, or it, it, it all, like, now, yeah, not everybody wants to hear it, you can get people that are hard headed and you know, that's a whole thing. Know, different thing, but then if you go back to Matthew, so even when we read this, but if we go back to Matthew 5, what is it, Matthew 5, 30 to 40, right? Mm -hmm. No, I've heard but I say okay. you do okay. not resist okay. an evil person. Now remember, what Jesus is doing here, this is a sermon, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking to, he's talking to people, he's trying to get these people, he's rebuking their way of thinking, so he's it's like you think about one way, God's thinking, he wants us to change our way of thinking. That's the main thing. Think of it differently. We don't want to think about like our rights, the things we want to think about other people. So he says, you have heard it said an eye for an eye or two for a two. And that was, you know, that that was actually from the law, but it was like people taking the law into their own hands. They were going like taking vigilante justice. Um, I use the example like I had my truck stolen one time when I was in New York. Not that I was thrilled about it. But I forgave the person right away, and I've never had any animosity. And I went, and, I, and, and this wasn't just, I didn't just get another truck, I took buses for five and a half years after that. So, I mean, this was, that's all I did. But I still filed, filled out a police report. So, like, when it talks about an eye for an eye, I still followed the justice system, because I had to, it was legally what I did, so I wasn't responsible for the, you know, so I still did what, so, like, even with the eye for you, like you could do that because it's part of the justice system. This is not what they were doing. They were taking the justice into their own hands. So this, this is what he's saying. You've heard it said an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So, but I tell you, resist an evil person, whoever stops you in the right cheek, turn the other to him. 
I mean, it's changing the way we think. Even Jesus, when he was when he was on trial by when he was on trial with Caiaphas, he said he didn't just he said if I've spoken evil, tell me the evil that I've spoken. He didn't just say hit me on the other cheek when he was actually hit. So this is just think of it in a different way. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. You know, I think it's more than just you know because people can go people go to all kinds of extremes. You know, you know what I mean. People go to all kinds of extremes, but it's if he wants us to change our way of thinking, the next time somebody does something. You know, it's basically, you know, I hate to say it, but it's like, what would Jesus do? How would Jesus react? Why do you need to say that? What? <laughs> what would Jesus do? What? Why would you need to say what would Jesus do? I don't hate to say it, but it becomes such a cliche. <laughs> Not to a believer, it doesn't. <laughs> no, but, but I mean, if people turn it into, people turn it into cliche, and then they I didn't. <laughs> You know, and, and that's exactly right. It, it's it's a matter of, of the heart. Where's the heart behind this law that we ought not to murder people? It's that, what, what, what is the antithesis? What are we called to do? We're called to love one another. We're called to love our neighbor. And that can only be true if, if there's uh, an understanding of what we've already discussed with the Beatitudes, right? We, we understand our desperate need for salvation, our desperate need to be reconciled to Christ. Um, and some of the situations we were talking about yesterday out there, you know, their sin permeates this world. And there's much that we can get frustrated with and, and get angry about. But just as much as we needed Christ and we still need Christ and there's no good in us without Christ, that is true of every situation, every person who we may uh, have a, a pang of anger uh, against. We recognize that all have sinned. We, we have all fallen short. That, that person who hurt me, who angered me, who frustrated me, that person is, is the, the, fulfilling, the self-fulfilling prophecy of our own depravity. Just like that. Just, just like you and I struggle in our ways and, and we step on toes, uh, so do others, and, and we, have to, we have to bear with one another. It's a hard issue. Uh, it's not keeping the law for the sake of the law. We, we Genuinely, with a pure and genuine heart, desire to be peacemakers uh, with one another so that we can glorify God, right? Who is the ultimate opponent of all who break the law, right? Um, as I was studying this particular portion uh, again, preparing for this morning, uh, reading more on this aspect of making friends quickly with your opponent while you are with him on the way. This portion holds deep spiritual implications of what are we saved from? We're we saved from the wrath of God, the judgment of Christ. If we sin, who is our opponent in law? It's Christ. And so we're not just making peace with one another, we're desperately seeking peace with God, too. That as we know that uh, He has something against us, and that draws us to repentance draws us to confession, that draws us to sanctification by his word and, and by the convicting power uh, of his word. Peacemaking not just for ourselves, but with others, but ultimately it's reconciliation with Christ. That our heart would be changed and be more like Christ. That, that all uh, would, would see that he has made us new. That he cleans us. Um, he saves us. He Anything good that is in our lives as believers comes as a result of, uh, of the work of Christ. Uh, and we need all, all people to see that. Yes, but. Um, one thing I can do, um, but Brother Danny mentioned earlier about you know, when someone wants to forgive somebody, but um, they don't do it. Like, uh, they're fixed by itself. 
and she's one mercy for the others to be used. Yeah. It's being doers of the work, yes, and not merely hearers. Mm -hmm. uh, another thought that occurs to me as we as we consider that Matthew 18, uh, I, I was even uh, accused of not following this uh, with, with my old church, with the way that, that, that we exited. And, and the thought that, that occurs, and that may have some truth in it, but that certainly was not my intention, but how legalistic can we get with something like this? Where we go to a brother who has sinned against us, and we say, hey, sin against them, and they don't hear it. How legalistic do we get that we just move on to the second step, and then the third step, and, and there's no bearing with that first step? How desperately do we want that reconciliation? That we would bear through those things, and not just leave it at, well, he said no, so hey, Johnny, come with me. No, he said no, all right. Come up to the stage. We're going to deal with you in front of the church, which is not really what it's saying. It's uh, more, more like with the leaders. But do we do those things once and move on to the next step? Do we do them once and, and just move on so that we can quickly be done with the situation? If, 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 if that's our heart, then then it's the same as as the Pharisees and and how they've used that law. We can use the New Testament concepts. Uh, just as legalistically as the Pharisees use the Old Testament. Uh, there is a proper order to these things, and yeah, we get to a point, like, like Sister Suki was saying, we get to a point where there's, there's no, uh, according to our efforts, there, there's, there's going to be a, a separation. And we know that there's going to be a separation. Uh, Christ tells us himself that, that families will be uh, at odds with one another. Right, where, where two and three are against one another. Uh, but how how desperately do we want to reconcile with one another and reconcile each other to Christ that we wouldn't just go through a process to say we've gone through a process and look, I, I've gone through the process and, and I'm right with the Lord. There needs to be love and there needs to be compassion and patience. In that, in that long suffering, and I think that that's what we struggle with as ultimately prideful human beings, is that uh, I want to be right with the Lord, and I will be right with the Lord, and I'll do everything in my power to be right with the Lord, even at the expense of love and patience for one another, and that's First Corinthians 13. You can have all the gifts, you can have all the power, you can have all of, of the righteousness, and yet we do not love. It's noise. It's, it's, it's useless. Uh, yes, Brother Jerry. Well, we always have this habit, too. I mean, well, I mean maybe the rest of you don't, but I do. Thinking that I'm right until I talk to the other person. There's a proverb, yep. there's Proverbs 18 and 17. I'm probably the only one that does yeah. this. But the first thing is cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. I mean, I, I can even give an example. There was, there was this time I was in the church, and I had, was this was that church here? <laughs> yeah, it was you last week, <laughs> and you were wrong. <laughs> no, it was not. <laughs> <laughs> this, I, I knew these, I knew these people. And they were, you know, like I was kind of like I was like friendly with one, and the other person liked to talk to me. But like to be honest, like personally, I kind of had a problem with this person. But I was like. It was personal, so I was like dealing with between the words. So it was like something I knew I had to get right. And this first person uh, comes up to me, male, um, and he, he tells me about this woman in the church who's always complaining that he's, you know, she, he's touching her knee, all this kind of stuff. And he's like, I, but this is just the way I am. I, don't, I was like, brother, stay away from this woman. She's in trouble. You know, blah, blah, blah. Stay away from her. And then but then the woman comes up to me, totally has no idea who spoke to me. And she starts describing the problem. And I, and I, does anybody remember those old cartoons where, where the guy go to the end of the class and play Don?
on Sunset, I was like, man, this proper doesn't point. She starts explaining the situation, and I'm like, she's like, well, I told her not to do it, and I'm like, you're not to do it, you shouldn't. You know, I, I mean, I don't care what it is, don't do it. I mean, it, it's like, and then, then, I, then, I, then I had a revelation. I followed Matthew 18, 16, where we all got together, we talked about it, they, 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 they settled it. Fortunately, she never heard what I said to him. Um, and they settled it. They went out of the room like hugging. And it's like, you hear one person says one thing and they can all sound right until, all, but always remember that. Even some of like, but even ourselves, when, we, when we're going through a situation, we always think that we're right. And just to entertain the possibility for maybe a millisecond, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm missing something. Or how many times I've went up to somebody and had this picture painted in my head of what it was, and then I talked to them, and it's like, it's not what I thought. They were going through something. They had something. You know, they perceived something, or whatever it is. But then you talk about it, and it just irons itself out. So yes, I agree with you. If we're jumping to step two, we, we've got a problem. Yeah. I mean, we are. Our problem is we want to camp out on step one as long as we can to resolve that with our brother or sister. I mean, we may, we may see counsel. I mean, I think yeah. that's a different thing. Like saying, I'm having, you know, there's, there's even a scripture that says that there was those two women that were fighting in the church, and Paul's like, help these women. Help these women out. I mean, sometimes we need to help each other. We shouldn't be jumping. Well, you offended me. I'm jumping to step two. Right, okay. Let's get on the rails here. <laughs> Are you ready? You're ready. And, and isn't it part of our, our edif edification of one another? That, that we would address these issues. It's like you said, we, we, may, we, we don't know the whole story until, the, until we go to talk. The chances are, if you're, if whatever it is you think you're right about, you're wrong somewhere. That, that's what needs to be tempered. That, that's what Christ is drawing attention to here. It's, it's not enough that we just be right according to these words. We must be right in our heart.
our sanctification, Lord, for ourselves and our edification of one another. Lord, that our hearts would always be set on your righteousness, your truth, and your love. And that all may see. Lord, let our light shine. Let our good works be seen. So that all may glorify your name, Christ. We ask these things this morning as we pray, as we prepare for this service, Lord, where we will offer you song and offering and, and work, Lord. We, we go deeper in your work. We pray, Lord, that you are honored and glorified in everything that we do with one another and in ourselves, God. Fix our hearts, Lord. Yes. Fix our hearts and our eyes on you, the maker of heaven and earth, the author and perfecter of this faith you have given.